And we are back. Richard Nixon live in the legal lounge, crntalk.com. That's crntalk.com. Make sure to join us on Facebook as well. Looks like I got it run, running right now. Facebook.com slash uh, CRN Talk. Also, make sure to visit Richard's uh, Facebook page as well. Just search Richard Nixon on Facebook. Also, check out his book, America, An Illusion of Freedom, available on Amazon.com, Barnes and & Noble, and as well on iTunes. And uh, Richard, we were talking, let's wrap this up with the uh, with the Kavanaugh situation going on. Give me your best bet here. Do you, well, first of all, this is my question to you, sir. There's been a lot of controversy, you know, over this pick about allegations that have surfaced to whether or not uh, they're credible or not that will be determined by the FBI and by the public at large. And why didn't the the Trump administration or the administration just, you know, put Kavanaugh on the shelf, take another conservative uh, justice that fits the same ideology, another Federalist uh, Society approved justice, and then submit that name instead? Well, because, again, what Lindsey Graham has said, and he's my current hero, if you will, uh, is that we can't allow these, this kind of smear tactic to destroy what had been, up till now, a very reputable and proper way to uh, ferret out who might be the best person to sit on the Supreme Court. Yet you have to remember that for the first hundred years of this country, there were no hearings. Yeah. The president basically got who he wanted. They knew that his pick was obviously uh, that that judge would side with what the president's wa president wanted, at least politically. So there's no secret to that. And then for the next hundred years or so, we had hearings, but the hearings were always conducted as gentlemen. Mm -hmm. In fact, we know that Lindsey Graham voted for uh, Miss, uh, who's our? Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. <laughs> Ruth Bader yeah. Ginsburg, thank you. And the Senate voted for something like 93 to 6 or yeah. whatever. So again, they gave up the partisanship. They knew the president wanted her. They knew she was from the ACLU. They knew what kind of decisions she would uh, emit and uh, or I should say evoke. And they still voted for her. And that's the way it should be now, except that it's become very, very political and Winning is really the only object today. That's interesting, because yeah, just in my experience as a layman, it seems, you know, before when I was following this just tangentially, uh, that it was the confirmation process was mostly about whether or not the justice was qualified, not particularly what the, exactly. their political positions were, because, you know, it's impossible for anybody to be completely apolitical, but when your party wins the presidency, and like uh, I believe uh, your hero, uh, Lindsey Graham, said this, is that, <laughs> that elections have consequences, and the administration gets to select whoever they want to select, and if that justice is qualified, like Lindsey Graham, you know, he, he's probably very, very different politically from uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but he Absolutely. deemed her qualified and confirmed her. Absolutely, and in fact, that's one of the problems that uh, some of us more conservative people have, frankly, with the Republicans. They do tend to be a little more gentlemanly, if you will. Uh, the old cliche about the Southern gentleman, very polite, courteous. Whereas the Democrats seem to, and they've realized that this works, they vote as a block. Once they've made up their mind what they, how they want to rule on a particular issue, they all fall in line. And it's more effective, frankly, because if you look at it now, the delay of this hearing, the uh, Kavanaugh hearing, could only help the Democrats. It can't help the Republicans. They're hoping that they're going to knock off a few Republicans, convert them from yes to no. That's the only purpose of the delay, because the, there's no Democrats probably that are going to vote yes. Mm -hmm. And well, I think the, you're right. Also, I, I think in the short term, this politically can serve the Democrats. But like uh, Lindsey Graham said, though, in the long term, I think it's going to be uh, for no matter where you are on the aisle, liberal or conservative, that they politicize the uh, nomination process. Yes. And uh, Lindsey Graham said this very forcefully. He said, you know, woe be on to the next person nominated for the Supreme Court. And so let's say if you're a liberal and let's say the next administration is a liberal administration, the precedent has been set. Yes. That, you know, and, and allegations can surface and, you know, you can delay, 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 and it's, it's a, yeah. And one more thing, they, the conservatives are uh, famous to mention the fact that there is someone, he is currently, I believe, a senator from Minnesota who's running for uh, attorney general of the state of Minnesota. He happens to be Muslim, which is not. Uh, Keith, just, Keith Ellison, I believe, yes. yeah. There's no question that his ex-girlfriend, if I've got it right, 
and her son witnessed the fact that he dragged her off the of bed and threatened her and smacked her and so on, and it's going nowhere. And in this case, the Democrats have actually said he denied it and we believe him, <laughs> which is counter to the the. Kaufman. Yeah, the, allegations have surfaced against uh, Representative Keith Ellison of Minnesota, who, yes. like you said, is running for uh, Attorney General of the state of Minnesota. And uh, yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's it's can be it's it's scary. It's 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 pretty frightening that you know because like, we want to talk about due process. I mean, what innocent before proven guilty. Uh, people on the left uh, have been saying that you know the Kavanaugh the uh, Kavanaugh hearings. It's not you know in the court of law. It's a job interview. But that's kind of a not necessarily the truth, because if he lies in front of Congress, that's a crime. Yes, I, I can. To the one, to a certain extent, I can agree with the Democrats that it is a job interview, and they have every right to vote against him for any reason or no reason. However, when they drag in these uh, semi-criminal uh, events, and in the state wherein it happened, I understand there's no statute of limitations, so theoretically there could be a lawsuit, a criminal lawsuit brought against him. Now, I understand that most prosecutors wouldn't take the case because there's so much uncertainty involved, at least in the Dr. Ford matter. But the point is, and as you point out, Mike, uh, it is uh, a lie, it is punishable but if you're lying to the Senate. So therefore, there should be maybe some kind of due process things, which means that the person accused has the right to remain silent and he has a right to be assumed innocent mm -hmm. until proven guilty. Yeah, I mean, that's the standard that we've become accustomed to about justice in the United States, but it seems like we're not seeing that right now. And uh, just uh, for our, 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 uh, our handicappers out there and our bookmakers, what, what do you think? Do you think that they'll confirm him? I do, but you know, it raises another question. Uh, when when he came back so so forceful, everyone said, at least in the media, that she had proven her case and they were leaning toward her mm -hmm. until he presented his very convincing side. Now, the interesting thing is he totally blew the demeanor thing because yeah. judges aren't supposed to act that way. Yeah. Well, then people would say, yes, but if you're falsely accused, even a judge has a right to righteous indignation. Yes. But then the next question is this. Us, let, I do believe he will be not. Uh, I, th I think he will be confirmed. But ha what happens if he takes the bench and has any one of these people associated with this crucifixion that he's gone through? What's he going to do? It takes a hell of a man not to retaliate. It does. But you're very right. I mean, I can understand if you know if he if he believes he's been falsely accused to have a very forceful response. But like you said, uh, the comp his comportment at those hearings, uh, you know, for example, by bringing up that he said that it was a you know a smear job by the Clintons, which yes. was kind of a non sequitur, yes. you know, regarding this issue. So let's say you know the D Triple C is suing somebody, and that goes to the Supreme Court. Are they going to ask for Kavanaugh if he is confirmed to be recused? It's very very interesting. We're going to watch in this case, this trial, this issue over the next uh, coming weeks. So, so stay here, you guys. Richard Nixon Live, The Legal Lounge. We'll be right back right after the break. CRN Digital Talk Radio, facebook.com slash CRN Talk. Located in the heart of Maui's premier resort, Kanapali Beach Hotel is officially recognized as Hawaii's most Hawaiian hotel and the number one best value in Hawaii. With a range of accommodations and affordable dining options, this is the ideal setting to turn Hawaiian dreams into lifelong memories. Live Hawaiian entertainment every evening, free year-round children's programs, weekly arts and crafts fairs, welcome breakfast, and departure kakui lei ceremonies add to the value. Swim in the whale-shaped pool, indulge in the fabulous spa and hotel salon. Enjoy Hawaiian hospitality at its best at the Ka'anapali Beach Hotel. Call 800-262-8450 or go to kbhmaui.com. That's kbhmaui.com. Aloha. When you really want Italian food, you have got to get to Columbo's. Columbo's Italian Steakhouse and Jazz Club, Colorado Boulevard, Eagle Rock. It's that little neighborhood place you wish was down the street from you. What happened to summer? You turn around and it's gone. So what do you do? Solution. 
Either stop turning around or head on over to Columbo's and enjoy the most delicious steaks imaginable. Seafood that brings awe and wonderment to your happy little taste buds. Columbo family Italian recipe so special they're kept under lock and key at an undisclosed and secure location. Jazz every night and the world's greatest meatballs. Need I say more? Oh, but I will. Enjoy the summer and head on over to Columbo's Italian Steakhouse. Good time central. Columbo's, because it really is that little neighborhood place you wish was down the street from you. Columbo's Mangia. Have you purchased a wine refrigerator or put a wine cellar in your home? Maybe you have a new wine rack. Great news, but what wines will you buy to stock your wine rack? Let me, Michael Horn, help. I'll find the wines for your wine cellar with your taste in mind. We'll determine what varietals, Cabernet, Pinot, Chardonnay, what types of wine, California, French, Italian, you like. We'll find you one-of-a-kind wines from all of our friends we interview daily on the What's Cooking Show and the What's Cooking on Wine Show. On a budget, we'll find you the best affordable wines. Want hard-to-get library wines? We can source those for you, too. And if you need cigars, let L.A. Ram sports legend and iconic actor Fred Dreyer make your selections. Hey, we can even host a wine dinner for you or set up a sports cigar party with Fred. Call me, Michael Horn, at the What's Cooking Today show. Call 818-818-6400. That's 818-818-6400. Let us find the dream wines of your lifetime. Welcome back. Richard Nixon live. So happy to be joined by Richard Nixon. He's a noted attorney, author. He's a scientist. He's a constitutional scholar. Check out his book, America, An Illusion of Freedom. It's available on Amazon.com and available on Barnes and Noble and available on iTunes as a physical copy or an ebook. It's a fantastic read. It's, uh, you know, it's it's not it's not scholarly in the terms of its if its language. It's beautifully written, but it's it's a book that anybody can understand and appreciate if you uh, are interested in these constitutional issues. And um, Richard, you know, you uh, you speak all around the the, uh, the South Island, all around the country about constitutional issues and promoting your book. And uh, you know, recently you uh, you spoke at, at, a, at a gathering uh, in, down here in Los Angeles uh, about you know important constitutional issues, issues that we discuss on this show. And you got some feedback that you know we want to kind of tie this all together. You know, to talk about all the you know the issues that we've discussed over these past uh, episodes, put it all together, and offer some solutions. And you you've you provided a great breakdown uh, of of what we want to discuss today. And um, you know, let's get into it. Uh, so who? Let's the clause one here. Let's what who is and what is the sole source of federal power? Well, it's clear that the sole source of federal power is the U.S. Constitution, which was ratified in 1789. We know that because there was no federal constitution or federal government prior to that date. Now there are those on the left that would like to, who are I would call. I'm through using the euphemism that they are simply. Uh, that they believe that the Constitution is a living, breathing document, they actually are anti-Constitution, I'm convinced. And so I'm going to drop the euphemism. Uh, but again, the sole source of federal power is the U.S. Constitution, and from that springs the duty of a judicial officer, whether it's state or federal, and that is to effectuate the intention of the legislature because that the legislature theoretically represents the people. And if we're going to claim that this is a government, a, a country of the people, by the people, and for the people, we should care what the people want. Yeah, it's the people's house, and that's that's key to the separation of powers, right? Absolutely. And again, as uh, Madison uh, claimed to be the father of the Constitution said in Federalist Paper 48, that it's evident that none of the three branches ought to possess directly or indirectly an overruling influence over the others, meaning that within the, their own specific spheres they are all powerful but they have no authority to to go across to the other side and somehow limit or interfere or usurp the powers of the others and one would think that you know, the separation of powers was to really protect the citizenry of the republic from you know a, a, a tyrannical uh, executive branch but 
from our old friend uh, Marbury versus Madison, what has happened, what has evolved, is that the Supreme Court, the judiciary branch, has become that tyrannical power, wouldn't you say? Exactly. And again, the Marbury versus Madison case from 1803, basically, among other faults, uh, held that the Supreme Court, uh, then ruled by uh, Chief Justice Marshall, said that the Supreme Court had the power to avoid acts of Congress. Now, again, it, it, that appears nowhere in the Constitution. Uh, the, court, the Supreme Court, if you will, made it up. And in fact, if we actually look at the Constitution and look at Article 3, which Article 3 does discuss the power of the judiciary, and we will see a very, very um, rarely cited Article 3, Section 2, Paragraph 2, which says, contrary to the Marbury versus Madison case, that the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction both as to law and fact, with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. In other words, Congress is in charge of the Supreme Court, but it's pretty obvious that they do nothing about it. And yeah. why, why don't they do nothing? Is it because they're lazy or because it's politically expedient for them? The latter, because it's, it's plausible deniability. They, that is the Supreme Court and Congress, have figured out that it's better that the people get upset over the Supreme Court, which they can do nothing about, rather than getting upset over Congress, which they can do something about, namely, they can unelect them. Exactly. The term limits for Congress people are called elections, and they, because the Supreme Court, you know, Very these good. justices, nine justices, have lifetime appointments, they are subject to a no, uh, no powers of the people. They're, they're, they're unchecked power. Yes. Un and unchecked power, you know, will corrupt absolutely. And I, you know, I, I don't believe that the Supreme Court does this in any, out of any nefarious ways. I don't think you believe they do this in any nefarious ways. No, I don't. In fact, uh, what's interesting is uh, we've actually done this. That is, Article Three, Section Two, Paragraph Two has actually been invoked uh, at least once that I know of in 1868 in the Ex Parte McCardle case. It's in the book. It's a very interesting read. And the justice there says just exactly what we've just said, that, hey, we can't go forward because the Congress has withhold, withheld jurisdiction from us to, to hear this matter. So it's dismissed. Absolutely. You guys, this is a fascinating topic. No matter. And we're, we're not, you know, we're not I'm not coming at this from a political way. I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that we we come from different political spectrums. But this is really about, you know, the separation of powers. And this is about how this government should work. And we're going to talk more about this right after the break. You guys check it out. Richard's book, America, an illusion of freedom available on Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble and iTunes. Check it out. For the getaway of your dreams, come to Hawaii's playground, Kaanapali Beach Resort, on the fun side of Maui, where the world comes to play. Find your spot on Kaanapali Beach with three miles of white sand, 12 resort properties, two golf courses, and two shopping centers. Enjoy the playground of Hawaii's ancient royalty. Kaanapali Beach Resort is Hawaii's original master planned destination resort and home of the Hawaii Food and Wine Festival. With views of two neighboring islands, you can breathe in the land's natural beauty from your favorite resort or golf fairway. Come experience Kaanapali's own special brand of Hawaiian hospitality with world-class dining, relaxing resorts, water sports, and activities of every kind. For romantic, family, and great friend getaways, discover the options of Kaanapali Beach Resort, where the world comes to play. Plan your getaway today. Visit kaanapaliresort.com. That's K-A-A-N-A-P-A-L-I resort.com. You check things all the time, like your email every 10 seconds, or your ex's Instagram, but what about checking something as important as your credit? Well, Discover makes it quick, easy, and best of all, free. Discover is now offering FICO credit scores to everyone for free, even if you're not a customer. And checking your score won't hurt your credit. We call it the Discover Credit Scorecard. And once you know your score, you should check to see if your current credit card is the best fit for you. Check your credit. Compare your card. Go to discover.com slash credit scorecard. Limitations apply. The following ad contains shocking material. Listener discretion is advised. Is someone in your family playing a dangerous game of Russian roulette? Over 43,000 people die a year from drug overdose. 120 people a day. Five people every hour. One person every 12 minutes. 
88,000 people die every year from alcohol abuse. Over 240 people a day, 10 an hour, one person every six minutes. Somebody you know may be next. Learn how to help someone you love get away from the drugs, alcohol, and bad influences. With the FMLA, people can take a leave of absence from their job and still keep it. Call Quit Drugs 321 now at 800-378-3315, 800-378-3315, 800-378-3315. That's 800-378-3315. If Ernest Hemingway was alive today, would he say this to you? Shakespeare, Mark Twain, Edgar Allan Poe, all great writers. And after reading your book, I simply must add you to the list. Wait, you don't have a book yet. So make a free call to Page Publishing. Their expert staff can help you turn your book idea into a real book, a masterpiece that could someday make the bestseller list in hard copy and digitally all across the world. Page Publishing can help you completely take your idea for a book, write it, and publish it. So if you want to join the ranks of some of the most famous authors in the world, call now for a free information kit. Turn your book idea into publishing gold. Make a free call right now to Page Publishing. 800-378-3212. 800-378-3212. 800-378-3212. That's 800-378-3212. Still got those annoying critters. I'm talking bees and fleas, spiders, ants, roaches, you name it. Plus those 24-7 wood-munching termites. Just make one easy call to Dewey, because Dewey knocks them down and keeps them out. To get Dewey's free inspection and $89 off with a regular maintenance program, call 800-209-0900, 800-209-0900, or go online to DeweyRadio.com. That's DeweyRadio.com. And we are back. Richard Nixon live, hanging out in the Legal Lounge here on CRN Digital Talk Radio, crntalk.com, streaming coast to coast and around the world. <laughs> I'm joined by Richard Nixon. He's an attorney and author of America, uh, An Illusion of Freedom. It's a fantastic read, available on amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, as well as iTunes. And uh, I believe you have a, a quote from Justice Black that you want to uh, share with our well, audience. Well, yes. Uh, but again, before we get to that quote, Mike, as uh, just going off the previous session that you mentioned. Uh, the, the purpose of my book is, is fairly apolitical. That is to say, I, I don't give my personal opinion as to how I feel about the court's decisions, except to say that the cases that I bring up are evidence that the court doesn't follow the Constitution. That's my point. And you might summarize that by saying, I'm interested in truth by adjudication. But getting back to the fact that the Supreme Court makes things up, that is, oftentimes rewrites the Constitution, is a quote by Justice Black in a case called Griswold in 1965, where he says, use of any such broad, unbound, unbounded judicial authority would make of this court's members a day-to-day -day constitutional convention. Mm. And I think that is so pertinent, because the whole point of... Uh, amendments to the Constitution, Article 5, were that the people, through their representatives, would, ch would change the Constitution. We never authorized a Supreme Court or any other court to, at a moment's notice, on a daily basis, alter or amend the Constitution. A day-to-day -day constitutional convention. That's yes, great language. It and that's very indicative of where we are today, because instead of arguing the case at hand, we were arguing how the Constitution can influence that case based on your particular viewpoint, and that is not what the framers intended. And, you know, we talked about the power of the judiciary in the last session, and now what power, the power of the legislator, legislature, legislature, of Congress, of the Senate, of the House of Representatives, the People's House, uh, where are their place in all of this? Well, that's right. The very first article of the Constitution from 1789 is Article One. It deals with the uh, Congress as opposed to the President or the Supreme Court. And the first thing out of the chute, if you will, Article 1 says, all legislative powers herein granted, 
shall be vested in a Congress, and uh, the Congress is composed of a House of Representatives and a Senate. So it makes it very clear that Congress does not share its legislative power with anyone, but it's been usurped by the Supreme Court, and frankly, it's been usurped by the executive branch as well. Uh, it's commonly called regulations. Mm -hmm. So they'll take a law that Congress passes that might be general in character, and from that springs forth hundreds and thousands of regulations, which, by the way, we're bound to follow those regulations as though Congress wrote them. They are the law even though they're written by people who do not represent us. Let me go back to something, this language right here, very specific language. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress. Yes. It doesn't say the Congress. That's true. Is this, can you extrapolate, can one extrapolate that not only is this referred to as the, uh, you know, the federal Congress, but also your, your local, state local Congress as well? Well, that's right. And I think there's no question that that's the proper interpretation. But again, um, the point that the Article One is supposed to make is, and the reason why they have the word all there, of course, mm -hmm. is that it hasn't changed meaning since uh, 1789, that it means what it says. That is to say, it does not share a legislative power with anyone else. Uh, but then we go on to, again, part of Article One, Section Eight. It's a series of 17 defined and limited uh, powers of the federal government, that is, of Congress. And um, there's a quote by uh, James Madison that says that the powers delegated by the proposed Constitution to the federal government are few and defined. Those which are to remain in the state government are numerous and indefinite. So it was always intended that when the federal government was created and Congress specifically was given these 17 powers, if you will, that that was the end of the line. They were not given any more powers except for number 18, which was what is now called the Necessary and Proper Clause, mm -hmm. which basically said Congress has given these 17 powers. And number 18 says, and also you can do whatever is necessary and proper to carry out those 17 powers. Which could be anything. Yes. Which could be, it pretty much invalidates the, the text of the first 17 enumerated powers that the Congress has. Well, it could, except again, if you take Jefferson's interpretation, what Def Jefferson meant by, he said what was meant by necessary and proper was, that if you didn't give them number 18 to give them some kind of implied power, it would render the express powers null and void, uh -huh. nugatory. So you only give them that which is necessary to carry forward the first 17. Now, uh, Justice, um, Justice, uh, boy, having a blank here on the McCullough versus Maryland case and the Marbury versus Madison case, Chief Justice Marshall, I should say, in 1819, he also held a case, uh, ruled on a particular case, McCullough versus Maryland. Mm -hmm. And in that case, he took the necessary and proper clause, literally reworded re it and changed it to appropriate or convenient. So that at that point, Congress could do, was given not only the implied power to do that, which was necessary, but to do anything which was convenient or appropriate. Interesting, and it's kind of uh, antithetical to what the purpose of the Constitution, it's the, one of the arguments in your book, is that the Constitution is not a, a list of laws that you know, the citizenship, citizenry can, cannot violate. It's more so it, the Constitution protects the public from yes, the government. exactly. And of course, that's wherein we get into the Bill of Rights. Now, so Article One, Section 8 had given Congress all these powers, and uh, number 18, of course, was the implied powers. But then because there was some question as to if there was a limitation on Congress, Madison was promised the Bill of Rights. So two years later, 1791, we have the Bill of Rights. Those Bill of Rights are limitations on the federal government to make sure the federal government is, knows that, by the way, we gave you all these powers under Article One, Section 8, but we're also limiting those powers and to include the 10th Amendment, 1791, which says, the powers not delegated to the United States by this Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, 
are reserved to the states respectively or the people. Uh, but we're going to talk about that right after the break because what happened was is that the federal government then applied the Bill of Rights to the states and this is where we are now and we're yes. going to talk about that. That's a very important issue also outlined extensively in Richard's fantastic book America Illusion of Freedom available on Amazon.com or anywhere fine books are sold available as an ebook or as a, a print edition. Make sure to check it out you guys and if you're watching the website make sure to check out Richard's website. You can see it right there also check out the YouTubes as well. I'll be right back, you guys. Hi, everyone. This is Fred Dreyer. You listen to me every week on the Sports Lounge. Well, I'm here to tell you my good friend and co-host, Michael Horn, is making his wine knowledge and his incredible industry contacts available to you. Mike will educate you in the world of wines. He will stock your wine cellar, wine refrigerator, or wine rack with one-of-a-kind wines. Also, as a lover of a great glass of port, I will share with you my experiences in finding the cigars that fit your palate. I will help you stock your humidor with great cigars that reflect your growing taste and the very best smokes for your budget. Mike and I can set up a once-in-a-lifetime wine dinner, and I can host a sports cigar party. Call us today at 818-818-6400. That's 818 818- 818-6400. Let us find the dream wines and cigars of your lifetime. What are you going to do with your old car? You can try selling it, you could junk it, or you could donate it to Heritage for the Blind. Your car will be towed away for free and your donation is tax deductible. Just call 1-800-785-9618. Heritage for the Blind accepts cars, vans, trucks, and boats. It doesn't matter if your vehicle runs or not. It will be towed away for free, and you'll be supporting those that need help. Heritage for the Blind is a nonprofit organization that helps the visually impaired live fuller lives. Call right now to donate your car, and as a special thank you for calling, you'll receive a free three-day vacation voucher to many exciting locations. Call Heritage for the Blind right now, 1-800-785-9618. Donating is easy and your vehicle is towed away for free. Plus, you'll get a free vacation voucher. Call now, 1-800-785-9618. That's 1-800-785-9618. And we are back. We are back in the legal lounge. Richard Nixon live. We are solving the world's problems during the break. And uh, yes, <laughs> absolutely, it's so nice to be joined by Richard Nixon. He's a, an author. He's an attorney. He's uh, just an amazing, amazing uh, constitutional scholar and constitutional mind. And, you know, one of the, the main themes of your book and also these, these past programs we've done is that uh, the original sin, one might say, or one of the original sins, is when the federal government decided it would be a good idea to apply the Bill of Rights to the states. Can you expand on that, sir? Yes. Well, of course, in 1791, two years after the Constitution in the main was ratified, um, Congress passed the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights was always intended, and I can't say this enough, The Bill of Rights was clearly intended to apply to the federal government only because the states had just created that federal government and wanted to remind the federal government, by the way, we've empowered you, but you do not have the power to do, and they listed the first ten amendments. The first one of the first ten amendments says, Congress shall make no law regarding religion, freedom of press, freedom of speech, etc. So there's no question. They used the word Congress to tell the world, if you will, that they were limiting Congress only. They were not limiting themselves. The states had created this, by the way, and obviously they they did not intend to limit their own power. Yeah, I mean, uh, if if you read back, I mean, at that time during the original colonies, they all had state constitutions, absolutely, and the the majority of them already had bills of bills of rights of themselves, which language almost identical to the federal bill of rights. Exactly. What was the purpose of the federal government? mandating the Bill of Rights, the Federal Bill of Rights, be accepted by the states? Well, okay, but before we get there, Mike, we've been, a, now that's 1791. Now, if we fast forward to 1833, and now we want to talk about Chief Justice Marshall again. Oh, yeah, there he is again. In 1833, he, again, penned a case, I believe he finally got one right, hmm. and that is Barron versus Baltimore. 
In that case, Barron was a, uh, he owned a business and it was on the lake, on the river I should say, and because the uh, people in the city of Baltimore decided to trench or deepen the uh, river to accommodate larger ships or boats, they necessarily pushed some of this uh, debris to the sides, made it impossible for, for people to access his business through his uh, wharf. And so he sued the city of Baltimore f under the Fifth Amendment, saying, you've taken money from me, and I must be compensated. I'm in the domain, essentially. Mm -hmm. And Chief Justice uh, Marshall said accurately that, by the way, I'm sorry, but uh, the Bill of Rights does not apply to the states. You can't sue the city of Baltimore or the state of Maryland for a violation of the Bill of Rights. That Bill of Rights only applies to the federal government. So it confirms at least as late as 1833 that there is no question that the Bill of Rights applied only to the states, not, uh, excuse me, not to the, excuse me, the Bill of Rights applied only to the federal government, not to the states. Okay, as of 1833 by that case. Yes. But what happened was? Well, later on, uh, the Supreme Court realized that it had empowered itself over Congress in the Marbury versus Madison case. But at this point, after 1833, the states were literally running wild. Mm -hmm. And they, in, in, tap, in terms of the Supreme Court anyway, they needed some controlling. Well, that really couldn't be done until there was some kind of controls in the Constitution against the states. That was after the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments came to be, and they addressed limitations on the states for the first time because the overarching theory of the theme of the Constitution was empowering the federal government and in limiting it. So as of 1865, the Bill of Rights, excuse me, and the Civil War, the uh, Constitution now addressed the states and limited the states as to what they could do. 13th Amendment said no more slavery, which of course is fine. The 15th Amendment said if you're a citizen, you can vote, uh, even though you may have been a slave, a previous condition of servitude does not matter. Mm -hmm. And the 14th Amendment, which defines citizenship, due process, equal protection, and liberty. And again, everything was understood, what things meant. Uh, the 18th, excuse me, the 14th Amendment, 1868, has and had a due process clause, which says that no state shall deprive a person of life, liberty, or property without due process. Again, it was understood that due process in 1868 meant that if you were accused of any of these things, you had a right to notice and an opportunity to be heard, so you could defend yourself. That was fine. That definition was extant all the way through to the 1930s or 40s, and I claim that it was uh, resurrected or at least envisioned at that point because the people who could counter the Supreme Court were now deceased. Mm -hmm. So what the Supreme Court did is they simply took those words due process and began applying the Bill of Rights to the states. And it was, as we've said earlier, it was clearly intended when the Bill of Rights were written 1791 that the Bill of Rights was applied to the federal government only. only only and that not the states the states were free to to have their own constitutions yes. and the, their own local control and uh, yeah, like you said Richard codified in the in the FDR administration where there's expa enormously expanded federal powers but do not fear listener we have solutions we have solutions and we're going to outline those solutions right after the break richard nixon once again thank you so much for joining us we'll be back right after the break and we're going to run through some solutions to these complex of problems and it's going to be a fascinating conversation so stay with us you guys richard nixon live crntalk.com streaming coast to coast and around the world also make sure to check out the video on facebook facebook.com slash crntalk also we're on youtube as well we are everywhere you want to be you guys so stick around we'll be right back Richard Nixon Live.
Come to Angelo's and Finchie's Restaurante to see memorabilia of movie stars and theatrical magic right in downtown Fullerton, California. The art of the great masters in an Italian town square complete with storefronts of old. Italian butchers and cheesemongers, fruit and wine vendors, seamstresses showing their wares. The romance of Romeo and Juliet. Find our mystical room of the moon. And don't forget King Kong, Dracula, Frankenstein, and who knows what awaits you in the wine cellar. Enjoy the great food. We hand stuff our pastas, roll each and every tortellini, bake our own bread, and make all of our sauces fresh from our private stock of Sicilian family recipes. Pasta to seafood, chicken to award-winning pizzas, tiramisu flowed in from Rome. If you can't find something on our menu to tempt you, you don't like Italian food. Try our Sunday brunch, all you can eat, just $21.95. And Angelo's and Vinci's has been named the best Italian restaurant in Orange County two years in a row, and our owner has been named Restaurant Tour of the Year. Angelo's and Vinci's, Fullerton, California, 714-879-4022 or angelosandvinci's.com. Do you want to fly somewhere, anywhere in the world? Smart travelers call MyFlightSearch.com for the best deals on flight tickets. Going to Manila, Bangkok, London, how about Singapore? Call MyFlightSearch.com for the lowest flight tickets available. What about a local vacation? Let's say you want to fly to Vegas, Orlando, Miami, Los Angeles, or Denver. Pick up the phone and call MyFlightSearch.com right now. We have exclusive deals that you can't find anywhere else. The only way you can get these low airline prices is by calling us. We have so many low prices available, we can't possibly tell them to you right here and now. If you're flying somewhere anytime in the next six months and you want the lowest airline ticket prices anywhere, you owe it to yourself to save a ton of money. So pick up your cell phone and call myflightsearch.com right now. Call 800-445-3166. 800-445-3166. That's 800-445-3166. Call now. 800-445-3166. Do you owe back taxes to the IRS? News flash, the president has changed the tax laws. And now, you may be able to pay the IRS less. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, the tax doctor can help you pay the IRS as little as possible allowed by law. There are new tax laws for business owners, the self-employed, even W-2 workers. If you have a back tax problem or a few years of unfilled returns, new help to save you money is now here. Call right now to see how the new tax tax laws can help you. Plus, right now, we'll waive the consultation fee and give you a free tax savings report. Attention business owners, the self-employed, and W-2 workers. Make this free call to the tax doctor now and learn how to take advantage of the new tax laws that may help you pay the IRS less. 800-985-1610. 800-985-1610. 800 800-985-1610. That's 800-985-1610. And we are back. Richard Nixon live in the Legal Lounge, CRNTalk.com. Thank you so much for joining us. We are talking all things constitutional. We're just kind of going over... You know, a briefly, uh, you know, synopsis of what we covered over these past several weeks, and also what Richard covers so eloquently in his book *America: An Illusion of Freedom*, available wherever fine books are sold. And we, you know, we talked about the bullet points here: the power of the judiciary, the power of the legislature, and then the Bill of Rights intended to apply for federal government only, not to the states. And uh, in section four, we need to talk about solutions. And uh, what are some of these solutions to really you know, set things right here, to really get, get back to the kind of system that the founders really originated? Well, again, uh, what we've said so far is that the Supreme Court, who acting, if, as, to use your term, Mike, acting paternalistically, have said they're justified in applying the Bill of Rights to the states through the Due Process Clause because they think they are now protecting the people from the bad state governments as as well as the bad federal government. Uh, now again, uh, I claim that what they've really done there, they weren't concerned with uh, protecting the people but, but empowering themselves. Mm -hmm. Because by applying the Bill of Rights to the states, anyone in a particular state that finds fault with uh, something in the state can cite one of the uh, Bill of Rights, one of the Bills of Rights, I should say, and then they have jurisdiction to hear the court, to hear the case, and the Supreme Court now can micromanage the states in terms of forcing them to obey 
the Federal Bill of Rights, when each state has their own Bill of Rights, or had their own, prior to the invention or creation of the Constitution. However, there is a solution to that, and one of the solutions that I propose is that uh, Article, the 14th Amendment has an Article 5, excuse me, has a Section 5, and it says that Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Which means that if we want to amend the 14th Amendment, we need not do another amendment. Uh, the Founding Fathers, or in fact the, I should say the drafters of the 14th Amendment, were prescient enough to realize that we could just do this, we could permit Congress to change the 14th Amendment simply by legislating. And that's kind of rare. You don't see that language in other amendments. Exactly. Uh, there are several in the uh, the Civil War Amendments, 13, 14, and 15th. But you'll notice that when you get on to 16 and 17 and 18, that language is absent. They realized they didn't want to give Congress the power to do that. So anyway, so what the fifth, what the art section, excuse me, the 14th Amendment, Section 5, basically says is that Congress can, at this point, if they could do it tomorrow, uh, redefine the Due Process Clause to basically say that from this date forward, the Bill of Rights does not apply to the states. It applies to the federal government as originally intended, and that would then shift the power to the states to have their own Bill of Rights if they so chose, or none if they so chose. But again, it would empower the states, and it would empower and again revise and, and replenish and refresh the Tenth Amendment, which basically said that any power not given to the federal government is reserved to the states. Absolutely, because we are a confederation of states. That's what the uh, the founders uh, uh, envisioned, and uh, we've come a long way from there, you guys. Thank you so much, Richard, once again for joining us. Thank you, listeners, so much for joining us as well. Any uh, questions, concerns, uh, comments, or feedback, please send us an email at richardnixon at crntalk.com. That's richardnixon at crntalk.com. And if you have uh, any vets out there who personally served Richard during his time of service, let us know as, all, yes. as well. Give us a call, 818 818 6400. Uh, thank you so much to all our Facebook listeners, all our cable system listeners, and people listening coast to coast and around the world on the internet. Richard, it's been a very, it's been a pleasure. Yes, thank you, Mike. All right, see you guys next week. We are here every week, every Tuesday, 4 p.m. Pacific time, 7 p.m. Eastern, and also replays all throughout the weekend and available via podcast, CRN Talk slash podcaster. See you next week, guys.